Welcome to video two for week six. In this video, I want to talk about the interaction of vector fields and curves. So if I have a vector field in some region in Rn and a curve in Rn, almost always for the rest of the course we're going to work in in R3, but I'll state a lot of these things in Rn because a lot of them are general. Any of them that don't use the cross product will generalize. But say I have a field in Rn, and I say I have some curve that goes through that field. I want to talk about the interaction of the field and the curve. And this is a pretty natural thing to think about. If my curve, if my field is, is force, gravitational force or electromagnetic force, then it's the force as you go along the path. So the force acting on something. It could be the force moving something. Uh, it could be the action of the force causing motion. Or it could be something going against a force. Your path sort of goes into the force. It could be looking at the interaction of how much work you have to do to sort of work against the force. If this is a fluid flow, you can think of, say, an object, maybe a buoyant object flowing through the field. Or you can also think of an object that's working, propelling itself to go against the field. Um, or something that's sort of going crosswise to the field. Whatever the case is, I want to talk about the interaction of the object on its path and the field that surrounds it. How am I going to do this interaction? Well, the field is expressed in terms of vectors. And I can understand the curve in terms of its tangent vectors at every point. And so if I have the field vector here and the tangent vector here, one way to understand the inter interaction of those two things is to take their dot product. And that's nice because the dot product sort of measures similarity. The dot product is going to be large if the field and the curve tangent sort of match up. But it's going to be small in the case like this, where the field is going this way and the curve is going um, mostly perpendicularly to the field because the dot product is zero when things are perpendicular and small when things are close to perpendicular. So locally, this dot product of the field with the tangent of the curve measures how the field and the curve are act interacting that, at that point. Large positive means that the curve is sort of going with the field. Large negative means the curve is going against the field. Small number means the curve is sort of going across the field. That's the local interaction. I'd like to sum this up and sort of say, well, over the whole path from here to here, what do all these interactions do? What, what's the end net result of all these interactions? Well, that's infinitely many things to sum up. So unsurprisingly, this turns into an integral. This is called a line integral. I'm going to define it for a vector field and a curve parametrized by arc length. One of the reasons we introduced the parameterization by arc length when we studied parametric curves in previous courses is because it's really, really good for these kind of definitions. If I define something in the parameterization by arc length, I know it's defined uniquely in only one way because there's only one parameterization by arc length. So it gives me an intrinsic definition, which is very, very valuable. So the definition here is just the integral of the thing I talked about in the last slide. The field and the tangent, in this case the unit tangent, of the vector field. And this is the field evaluated on the curve. So if I have a point on the curve gamma of s, then f of gamma of s is the field at that point, and capital T of s is the unit tangent at that point. So I do evaluate the field at the point on the curve, and I do evaluate the unit tangent. And this is nice because this gives me um, something that involves only s. In this composition, the field has x, y, and z coordinates. But if I replace gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 3 for x, y, and z, then the field is evaluated on the curve is an expression just an s. This is an expression s. Take the dot product, integrate an s over the length of the curve, because the, the parameterization by arc length always has range from 0 to the length of the curve. There are two common notations for this integral of gamma of f dot unit tangent ds, and sometimes it's just f dot ds. This is a pretty common shorthand notation, which I will also use for the integral of a vector field over a parametric curve that is measuring the sort of net total of that interaction of the curve, of the tangent of the curve with the vector field. All right, that's all very well and good, but defining things with the parameterization by arc length is awkward for calculations because having to calculate the parameterization by arc length is often very, very difficult. So I want to talk about how to calculate this in general. So if I have a curve which is parameterized just any old way, 
I can get to this parameterization by doing a substitution from the parameterization by arc length. So if I set up the integral that defines the, the, the line integral and then substitute uh, the parameterization by arc length back to this arbitrary parameterization t, the relationship between these two things is going to be the length of the tangent. And the unit tangent is given by the tangent to this under parameterization divided by that length. And I can make those substitutions. I can make the substitution, instead of gamma of s, I'll replace s with s of t. The unit tangent is calculated in the new parameterization as gamma prime of t divided by its length. And ds gets replaced with the length of gamma prime of t dt. And this is really, really lovely because these things cancel out. This is a, an unusual instance in calculus where we actually get a really, really nice result that looks a lot like the intrinsic result for calculation, but this we can calculate in any parameterization. What this essentially proves is that if I calculate this in any parameterization, since there's a substitution that shows it came from the unique parameterization by arc length, that this calculation is independent of parameterization, which is exactly what I wanted. I want to know as I go over this whole curve from here to here, what's the net effect? And I don't want this to depend on how I parameterize this curve. So this is how we calculate a line integral. Let me do a couple of examples. Here's an example that I used in a previous video in a previous week. This is a vector field that looks rotational. Its integral curves are counterclockwise circles. And I'm also going to move in a counterclockwise circle with my curve. So what I need to do to take a line integral, I need to take the derivative to get the tangent of the curve. I need to evaluate the vector field on the curve. I do that by taking the expression for the vector field, so negative y, I'll take the y component of the curve and replace it for y, that gives me negative r. And then here, the x, I will take the x component of the curve and replace it there, giving me r cos t. So to evaluate a field on a curve means to replace the variables x, y, and z with the x, y, and perhaps z components of your curve. All right, then I've got the tangent and the field. I take the dot product of these two things. This simplifies nicely down to r squared. And then I integrate that over the parameter domain, which is 0 to 2 pi. This is the integral of a constant, so I get a nice 2 pi r squared. And this is positive because the directions of the field are sort of these counterclockwise rotation. And the path is also a counterclockwise rotation. This is positive, showing that the field and the path are working together or going in the same direction. I get a positive line integral reflecting that. Let me now talk about gravity and potential energy. As I said before, given that the scalar field that gives a conservative vector field is called a potential, the example of forces and potential energy is fundamental to all of this. So here's the force of gravity per unit mass. All the forces we're going to talk about are going to be always per unit mass. So if it's on a particular mass, you'd write a particular mass m here. But as it's stated, it's force per unit mass acting on the masses around it. Uh, gravitational constant g, uh, some large mass in, centered at the origin. Uh, and it points back to the origin. So if you're at a point x, y, z in R3, then the force of gravity points back to the origin. This should be cubed to make this make sense. Uh, this is, in fact, 1 over r squared. If you take the length of this and simplify the square root, you will get gm over r squared, where r is the distance from the origin to the point you're caring about. These negatives, again, pointing back towards the origin because the force of gravity pulls everything back to this large mass m at the origin. Say now I have a curve that's going away from the origin in a straight line uh, where a and b are positive constants. So I start at aaa and I'm moving away and eventually end up at BBB. So I want to sort of think of what's the, what's the effort required? What do I have to do to move away from this force of gravity? So I do the things. I calculate the tangent of the curve. Derivatives here are pretty easy. I get 1, 1, 1. I calculate the vector field evaluated on the curve. So I'm going to take this x, this y, this z, this x, this y, this z, and replace them all with the x, y, and z components of the curve, which are all t. If you do that, you get this expression, and you can factor t out and simplify the square root and turn it into negative gm over t squared, 
3 root 3 and the vector 1, 1, 1. And then you take the dot product of these two things. 1, 1, 1 dot 1, 1, 1 is 3, so I just get a 3 in the numerator, which cancels off there, and I get this expression for my dot product. Then I'm going to integrate over the parameter domain from A to B. So I integrate that expression from A to B. The constants come out. I'm integrating 1 over t squared, which is negative 1 over t. Evaluate on the bounds. And give me 1 over A minus 1 over B. Once I evaluate and account for this negative sign. And the result I'm going to get is I'm going to get gm a minus b over ab root 3. Now, under the assumption that a and b are large, but a minus b is small, so if I have my uh, mass here, and I have some distance a, a here, and the change to the distance b is quite small, this is what happens, say, on the surface of the Earth. The center of the Earth is very, very far away, but differences on the surface of the Earth, if you're moving something a few meters on the surface of the Earth, that's negligible compared to these large distances. Under that particular assumption, I can actually assume that gm over ab root 3 is constant. There's going to be some subtle changes in this, um, in a and b, but those changes aren't actually going to make a substantial effect in significant figures compared to this change ab. So if I make that Replacement for little g, I get little g a minus b as a result of this line integral. Uh, factor on a negative sign, I get little g b minus a. If I think of b minus a, b is the further point away. This is going to give me basically the change in distance, or I'll call that the change in height. And this is per unit mass, so if I wanted to do this for an actual mass, I would multiply by m. And as I said, there's always a little sign error because of the difference between gradients pointing in positive change and potential energy wanting negative change. So I multiply by negative 1 to account for that sign error. Then the result of this should be mgh. And I can interpret that as the change in potential energy. The work that is done sort of moving away is a net gain in potential energy. And I recover the sort of high school physics formula of if you move something height h on the surface of the Earth, and g is the approximation of the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the Earth, which is exactly what you get when you make this particular assumption, then I recover exactly what I should have for the change in potential energy. I'm going to keep coming back to this example in the next video again, because this is a really important example that underpins what's going on. I would like all of the things we're doing here to make sense for gravity and potential energy and for electromagnetism and potential energy. That's really the motivation behind the terminology of potential and this whole idea of conservative forces.